This is the 30th lecture in a course on heuristic search. And in this lecture, we're going to continue from the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we looked at how we could understand the branching factor of a state space or how we could analyze a state space to compute the asymptotic branching factor. So that is through most of this course, we've talked about B, the branching factor, as if it was just some known constant. And so now we finally know how to get that constant. And what we're going to look at in this lecture is, given that we have that, we're now going to build on that to say, well, what is the impact of a heuristic on our actual search? And there's two possible impacts of a heuristic. So that's the topic we're looking at here, because we want to know, um, hey, you know, what, what is a heuristic actually doing to our search? So there's two possibilities. One is this could be reducing the branching factor. And if you look at a book by Pearl, Judah Pearl, in 1984, this is the, sort of the first textbook on heuristic search. Uh, Judah Pearl later went on to win a Turing Award for his work on Bayesian reasoning and um, um, things like that. And so he uh, was probabilistic reasoning and causality. And uh, anyway, so he, he went on and worked on a lot of other topics. But he had some very early work on heuristics and the impact of heuristics. And a portion of this book is just based on many of the basic properties that we looked at earlier in this course, thinking about heuristics and uh, consistent and inconsistent heuristics. But a portion of the book also was trying to analyze what the impact of a heuristic was. And in that work, according to the assumptions that he made about the state space, the assumption was it takes some branching factor B and makes it to be A give it where a is going to be less than or equal to b. So my state space, instead of being b to the d, would be a to the d, where a is some smaller branching factor. And what we're going to look at today is a prediction that says it's essentially looking like reducing the search depth. And this is due to Korf, Reed, and Edelkamp in 2001 is the journal paper that they published that had this result. So what this paper is saying is, hey, given that we now know how to build heuristics and we, on certain types of state spaces, and particularly exponential state spaces, where we can build heuristics and where we can analyze the branching factor, that we're going to be able to do some analysis that's gonna show us what the impact of, of, a, um, of, doing, of adding a heuristic or the strength of a heuristic on an algorithm like IDA star. And so we're going to need a couple of assumptions to do the analysis here. And so I'll write some of them here. This paper had uh, basically a very simple, well, it's not necessarily simple, but it had sort of a, a straightforward analysis of what could happen when we add a heuristic to the problem or if we look at changing the strength of a heuristic. And there's later papers that went and made some more complicated assumptions about what could happen. And so we're going to look at the simpler version of this today. And so some of the assumptions we're going to make is we're going to think about having a consistent heuristic. We're going to think about, uh, for our analysis, uh, unit costs, both in our heuristic and in the uh, a cost function. So everything's going to be basically integer costs. Um, again, we can relax these assumptions, but they just make the analysis a little bit more complicated, and this will be enough for what we need for, to get the flavor of what's going on. And uh, the, there's some fairly straightforward points of where you can, you, where would you need to change things to make the analysis more accurate. What we're going to be thinking about is a single iteration. And we're going to think about a single iteration of IDA star. Okay, so we're not going to be doing duplicate detection. We're just going to expand all states that uh, exist in some particular uh, some particular depth. So this doesn't directly apply to A star. And we're going to imagine that we have some threshold of C. So we're thinking about you know what are the states? Everything with f of n less than C is going to be expanded. 
And we're going to assume that we have some distributions and we'll define what those distributions are on the heuristic. And just to say that this analysis followed fairly directly after the invention of pattern databases. Because pattern databases were one of the first heuristics where suddenly we were able to reason about a, um, about a heuristic and how it applied over a state space because all the values, instead of just being some function, were now sitting in a table and we could think about and reason about those values in a table. Okay. So um, we have a state space and let's assume that there's n. Okay, so this is the analysis we're looking at, but that's sort of the overall question we were looking at here. We have some assumptions and so we're going to we're going to make some more definitions here that are going to allow us to get to our analysis. So what we want to think about is the distribution. So when I think about the distribution, of some heuristic H. Now, practically speaking, if um, you think about like, I, I think I showed some pictures in the additive pattern database lecture, we can think of a heuristic as a um, as we have different values and then we have a count and so we could imagine that you know my values are going to start at zero and oftentimes this is done logarithmically because the state space grows exponentially but we see that you know the number of states is um, you know the number of values there's a limited number of values here and there's going to be some you know, point where I have some maximum value. But anyway, there's some distribution of heuristic values that I'm going to get, and I could be plotting them. I could give you a table of those. But uh, practically speaking, we're going to put together uh, that distribution. And so given some distribution here, I want to be able to talk about this not sort of as a picture, but I think about it mathematically. And so we're going to start out by defining sort of one slice of this distribution. And we're going to define this as D of A, where A is a value. It's going to tell me how many states there are that have a particular value A. So if I want to write this out, so D of A is equal to the number of states with a heuristic of A. So that's fairly simple. That's just saying what is, for any one value here, how many states are there in this distribution that have any particular heuristic value? Now, in practice, what we're thinking about is that if I'm doing a search, I might be expanding all states with f less than some value c, whatever that my, my threshold is there. And so what we're going to want is actually a distribution, a cumulative distribution, because that's going to talk about the states that I would expand at a certain depth of a search. So the cumulative distribution is going to be capital D, and we're going to pass in some heuristic values. So we're going to say, so in, implicit here, this is so this, this cumulative distribution exists for a particular heuristic. I'm not writing the heuristic in the state space here as parameters. We're just saying you're going to give me some heuristic value. And what I want to know is cumulatively, how many states have a heuristic which is less than or equal to that given heuristic which is passed in. Actually, and not, and not the number of states, what we actually want to want is the fraction of states. So what I'm going to use here is 1 over n, where n is the number of states in the state space. And then I'm going to sum up how many states from a is equal to 0 to h of d of a. Okay. So I'm just going to sum up how many states are there with heuristics, you know, 0, 1, 2, all the way up until some value h. And then I'm going to, that's the total number of states I find there divided by 1 to normalize that to get basically a fraction. And so this is the heuristic distribution. We're going to call this a heuristic distribution. And this is a cumulative distribution represented as a fraction of states. And what's interesting now, okay, I have a heuristic distribution. It tells me how my heuristics are distributed through the state space. And actually, I can show you down here. I've taken a table from this paper by Corfried and Edelkamp, and I've reproduced it down here. And uh, we could ignore this part over here. So we're just going to look at this piece right here. 
and we can ask for each heuristic value. How many states are there with that heuristic value? That's this column right here. And then we can ask what the sum of the total number of states. So what this is, is this is actually the sum of, of the value so far. So this is the sum of all of so this value. Let these disappear. So this is the sum of all of these thus far. This is the total number of states. And so each of these entries is this divided by that. And that gives us our distribution, which is our, um, which is our heuristic distribution. So that just says, if I take a random state in the state space, what is the probability that the heuristic is that value or less? That's D of H, the heuristic distribution. Now, um, what we're going to want to look at is not just the heuristic distribution, that tells us over a whole state space, but we're gonna think about when we search what is actually the states that we're going to encounter when we do a search in now in theory it would be from a particular state what we're going to do is we're going to actually average over all states and uh, i won't go into this too much but we're going to sort of look at things from a very average argument and again there's work that tries that corrects this and says hey if you weren't looking sort of from an average perspective but you wanted to look from a particular state space state in the state space and you're searching from there we might see a slightly different distribution. But uh, okay, so we've got the heuristic distribution here. And this is just says, how are heuristics distributed through the state space? And now what we want is an equilibrium distribution. We want an equilibrium distribution, which is gonna say in practice, as I'm doing, right? We In the last video, we said, as we search and the branching factor goes to some distribution, we wanna ask the same question, what is gonna be the distribution of heuristic values that I will actually encounter in my search. Okay, and the fact is, is that uh, if, if you remember the distributions, like in the five puzzle, we don't, that it has, you know, so there's two, there's two middle uh, edges, uh, middle tiles, and then there's four corner tiles. And so we'd expect maybe that we'd spend, you know, 66% of our time with a blank in the corner position, but in practice, we only spend about 64, 65% of the time with the tile in the corner position. And that's because the corner position has a lower branching factor where we have a higher branching factor in these middle positions uh, in the middle of the, of the cube. So sorry, just in the middle of the sliding tile puzzle, right? So if we think about the, um, the five puzzle, we'll actually spend more time with the blank in these states, which have a higher branching factor then we spend in these states, which have a lower branching factor. So we don't spend 66% of our time um, in these states, even though they represent 66% you know, of the locations where the blank could be. Okay, so we wanna compute a, the actual distribution of what we're gonna see of our heuristic values, taking into account the fact that we're not going to see all states uniformly, but the blank can be in different states. And so the way we're going to get this, is the equilibrium distribution, is we want to think about the, uh, well, so we really want, we want the probability of H. So we're going to call this P, capital P of H. It's going to be my equilibrium distribution. And this is just, should be the probability that the heuristic is less than or equal to Sorry, we have to distinguish here between h of a state in my state space is less than or equal to some value h. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about is I'm going to break this up into two pieces where I'm going to basically look at the conditional distribution based on the fact that the that the branching factor changes whether I'm in a um, in a corner, whether the, the blank is in the corner in the middle. So what I can ask here is I can, or I can rewrite this and say, look, what I want is the probability of, and then I'm gonna look at the heuristic distribution. So I essentially wanna look at D, but I'm gonna do this conditionally. So this is gonna be D of H. So the probability that the heuristic is less than H, given that I am in a, a side, it's in a side location, times the probability that I'm in a side plus the probability of D of H. So the probability that, again, my heuristic distribution for some value H, given that I'm in a corner, times the probability of being in a corner. 
And so this, um, you, this is just another way of rewriting the probability that the heuristic is less than some value h by breaking it up and looking at it conditionally. And just to show you the impact of, of breaking this up here and doing the calculation this way, and the difference between d, so right, if the probability of being on the side, if you know, if these all worked out, then this, in, in, in some state spaces, this is exactly equal to d. But because the it, it isn't in all state spaces, we're going to see here. Um, so this is where we take into effect the number of states where the blank is in a corner. Um, the side is what I've called the middle. And uh, so those are the two ways we can divide this up. And what we see here is the, if we look, for instance, at this one, so at heuristic equal to five, when I think about the distribution of whether I'm on a corner or a side, then what I see is my heuristic value here is 0.276 as opposed to 0.277. So the average heuristic value that I expect to see, this is for Manhattan distance, but the exact average heuristic value I expect to see is smaller than I would base, expect to see based on the overall distribution. Okay, so what we see here for these problems is that the heuristic distribution is different than the equilibrium distribution, where the equilibrium distribution is saying, um, so these are important here. These are saying, and the equilibrium distribution comes actually from the, from it's defined in, in terms of this actual heuristic distribution, but it's basically saying, look, in practice, I don't spend the same amount of time on all types of states. And so I can break down by the types of states that I'm going to see and the heuristic distribution I'll see in those different types of states. And because, because I've shifted my distribution around in practice, then I'm going to want to represent and think about this equilibrium distribution that I'll see when I am you know, doing some really large search. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens in practice if we start searching, given that I have this equilibrium distribution. Okay. And what we're going to do, again, I've taken a figure from this 2001 paper, uh, just because this would be a lot to write out in practice. And when I think about a search, so I'm going to walk through this figure. So up here, we have a heuristic value. The heuristic we're looking at for this particular sample problem either is a value of 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And we're going to consider a search that goes up to depth 8. So the depth of the search is 0 to 8. At depth 9, we're going to be pruning off all states in the state space. And we want to think about, given that we have these this range of heuristic values, we're doing one IDA star iteration. We're going to prune all states which have F cost, which is, in this case, we're going to do a search depth of 8. So the search depth is going to be 8. Um, and the question is, what states, if we, uh, and well, so that's going to be my limit. This is actually going to be the cost limit of IDA star. Okay. And we're going to ignore the goal here. So it could be that actually the goal, you know, the goal could be a depth four on this particular problem. I would actually have a heuristic of zero. So the goal could be sitting here. We're going to ignore that. We're just thinking about if I do a search to depth eight, on average over all states in the state space, when I do a search of depth eight, how many nodes do I expect to expand? Okay. And what happens is that as we're searching, what can happen? So let's just say I start with some initial value. Maybe my initial heuristic is three. Uh, because the heuristic is consistent, the heuristic cannot be any lower than two and it cannot be any higher than four. And because the maximum value of the heuristic is four, then we're limited. We're never going to see states with heuristic values that are greater than that. And then if we think about our search, what goes on when we search? Well, because I'm going to search to depth eight and the maximum heuristic is four, I'm not going to get to states that have an F cost greater than eight. If you think about, so what is the F cost? The F cost is just the sum. If I take any state here, I take the, the depth plus the heuristic. So this state has an F cost of eight. This state has an F cost of seven. This state has an F cost of six. And so when I when I begin to search, I'm, I'm going to use a depth of eight. I'm going to see, well, so I've got some F cost. And this F cost is, um, I'm going to, like, I, I'm going to generate all the states that have F cost of eight. If I have F cost of nine, I'm going to prune it. Okay, so um, initially I have a heuristic of three in this particular case or whatever it's going to happen to be, but I'm going to expand all of these states, all of these states. 
the first place I can possibly get pruning is so I do state all states with depth four and all states with a heuristic value of four. And so all of these states inside here are guaranteed to have an F cost, which is less than or equal to eight. Okay, because four plus four that's here is equal to eight. So I'm gonna I'm guaranteed to expand all these states. And then what's gonna happen when I get to depth five. I'm going to start to be able to prune states because there are going to be some states with depth five and a heuristic four. And those states do not have to be expanded because they're greater than our search depth or our cost limit of IDA star. So what we want to know is here, if I just think about, so N is going to be the number of states at a particular depth. So I have the number of states at depth zero, at depth one, at depth two, at depth three, at depth four. I expand all of those. Uh, but what about depth five? Okay, so P here is the is in the actual search that I'm doing the pro, the probability that has that a particular state has a heuristic which is equal to four or less, and so here we know because the maximum heuristic value is four, the probability of having four or less is going to be equal to one. So um, that's still going to be the number of states with uh, a cost of four, but when I get to depth five. Now what I want to know, the nodes that I'm going to expand are going to be those with a heuristic of three or less. So this distribution says how many states at um, are, are going to have a heuristic value of three or less, or what's the expected number of states. So as again, we're thinking about this on average over all searches. And so the equilibrium distribution basically says, what's the probability that, that my heuristic is below that value? And so of all the states, so right here, n sub five is the number of states at depth five. And what I wanna know is how many states have a heuristic of three or less. Those are the states that I'm gonna expand, and these are the ones I'm not gonna expand. At the next layer, I'm gonna expand all the states that have a heuristic of two or less, and a depth of six. So number of states at depth six, that's gonna be the total number in the brute force tree times the number that have a heuristic of two or less. At the next level, it's the number of states with, a heuristic, with um, depth of seven or the total number of states I would encounter at depth seven times the number that have a heuristic of one or less and at depth eight, you must have a heuristic of zero to be expanded. So the number of states with a heuristic of zero uh, and times the number of states at depth eight. So what this is giving us is it's giving, and as this is on average, it's giving us the expected number of expansions at each level here. So what are we gonna do? What we're gonna do is we're gonna write down the total number of states inside this tree. And so I'm going to, um, I'll actually go ahead and write this, uh, mark these, right? So these are all the states that I'm going to expand in a search that has a depth a search limit of eight. And so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to do a summation here that sums up the number of states that I'm going to see. Initially, I'm going to see all of them. And then once the probability starts getting uh, this calculation, this distribution is getting uh, small, then we're going to start reducing the number of states we see there. Okay, so what we're going to do here is, um, or what Korfried and Edelkamp did, is we're gonna write out this function. So this function is the expected number of states in a state space with n states with a search cutoff of c, and p is my function that's giving me the probability. So and so n, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, look, I'm gonna sum up over all possible depths that I could be doing here to zero, one, two, three, four. And what I'm gonna do, so this is the sum, from i is equal to zero to c. Okay, because if c is my search depth, I'm gonna go, in this case with eight, I'll go up right to here, and then everything after this, I won't do it. Okay, and then what I wanna know is the number of states at depth i, in this case, it's just b to the d, uh, where b is the, or b to the i, where b is the asymptotic branching factor, times the probability of states having a heuristic value of C minus I. Okay, so what we see here when I get to I is equal to eight, or sorry, so yeah, I'm, I'm adding up my cost and uh, C is the maximum that I'm doing. 
And so I'm doing, I'm thinking about C minus I, so C minus zero, C minus one, C minus two, three, four, five. It's giving me all the um, values there, and I, um, it was my search depth. Okay, so C, yeah, so what, yeah, what I'm saying is, what, you know, what's the probability that I get here of a heuristic? This is, would be four, five, six, seven, eight. And so this is P of C is eight minus zero. Uh, this is the probability that heuristic is eight or less. So that's what the C of I is doing. When I'm down at the bottom here, then when what I'm getting up here is when I is equal to eight, that's the number of states at depth eight, but then uh, C is eight, so eight minus eight is zero. So this is where I'm getting P zero. Hopefully that makes sense. And so that's this is actually predicting how many states I expect to see in a state space or given n. If n here could be my uh, is, is my prediction function for the number of states, c is the depth of my search, and p is my distribution. Okay, so now what we can ask the question is what happens? What is my heuristic branching factor? So I want to know if I'm doing a heuristic search. And, I, and E is telling me the expected number of nodes I'll expand. If I want to know the branching factor, I just have to ask the question. Um, so this is going to, I'll say B of H, which is my heuristic branching factor, is going to be, in general, the number of states N when I do a search to depth C with my distribution of P. And the same growth, except now I'm going to do a search to C minus 1. So if I just do a search to some cutoff and then I do a search to one higher of a cutoff, right? so this is some cutoff and then one higher of a cutoff, and I look at that ratio, that's going to tell me what my heuristic branching factor is. Okay, and I've got this right above here, so this is going to be not too bad to write down. i is equal to zero, the sum over c of n of i times p of c minus i over, and then here we just have the sum I'm sorry, my summation is really ugly looking there. From i is equal to zero to c minus one of n of i. And here, because I'm um, going one less here, so this is going to be p of c minus one minus i. And what I can do is I can just write out these terms to see what happens here. So if I write out these terms, what, and remember n of i, is just equal to b to the i. Okay, so if I look at this, what am I going to get here? Well, I'm going to get b to the zero times p of, and then I put zero in here, and so I'm going to get p of c. Okay, and plus now I'm going to have b to the one. So I'm looking here. This is going to be b to the one. Um, i is going to be one, so it's going to be c minus one. P of c minus one plus, and in the end, what am I going to get here? I'm going to get b to the c times p of zero. And in the bottom, what I get is I get b of zero, b to the power of zero times p of c minus one, plus b to the one times p of c minus two. And in the end, I'm going to get um, b to the c minus one, times p of zero. Okay, and if we look at this, what we see is there's actually, when I write all of these summations out, most of these terms are actually very similar to each other. And there's one term here that is only on the top and is not on the bottom. And so if we look at this term, because remember we're uh, here, we have a, this is c minus one and this is c, so I get one extra term up here. So if we look at this one extra term, b to the zero is equal to one, and the probability of C, so this is the probability of having some heuristic of C, whatever my maximum one is, um, this is going to be at most one. And so this term is just a term of one here. And we're going to ignore that. So actually what I should do is I'm going to say, by ignoring that, we're going to get an approximate result here. And so let's just see what happens when you ignore that. So um, I'll just, we ignore that. And what I see here actually is I'm going to write just these terms out. So I get b to the one times p of c minus one plus, 
And then down here, I'm going to get b to the 0 times p of c minus 1. And at the end, I get b to the c times p of 0. I had an extra parenthesis there. And then I'm going to get b to the c minus 1 times p of 0. And what we see here, now that I've ignored this uh, term here, is that each of these terms are going to align with each other. And remember, we just had one extra term on the top than the bottom. So each of the remaining terms align with each other. And the only difference is the factor of b. There's an extra factor of b in the top. And so what that tells us, actually, is that the, on average, the heuristic branching factor is going to be exactly equal to the asymptotic branching factor. And because that's the case, it tells us that the impact of a heuristic on search, given that we have a pattern database, given that we, you know, so given that this is actually telling us what the impact of, um, so going up here, that this equilibrium distribution tells us that this is what happens in practice when we're searching uh, for the distribution of states, then it's going to say when that happens, then there is no impact on the branching factor by adding a heuristic. The, thus, the impact can only be on the depth of search. Okay, And so in some ways, that's disappointing because the branching factor has a much bigger impact. Like having a slowly re small reduction in the branching factor can have a big impact on the number of nodes expanded. The depth has less of an impact. I mean, obviously, there's constants for which this uh, impacts things. But what this says is um, that, therefore, the impact of doing a of adding a heuristic or improving a heuristic is going to be related to um, decreasing the depth of search, not related to uh, decreasing the branching factor. And as I said, there are uh, there's other work that's been done that looks at this prediction of you know what is the what is the trade off between a heuristic between the number of nodes I need to solve a problem and the amount of space that the heuristic takes. And so those sorts of trade-offs are, are very interesting and are related to this analysis. But overall, it says that the heuristic does not impact the branching factor. So a heuristic is reducing the depth of search. And, uh, and so now we can understand, at least here, what this impact is. And just to say, if you go into the, this paper, they went through all the states in the state space, they did searches on them, and they got an exact prediction. You can get an exact prediction when you do this sort of average search. And so this equilibrium distribution, particularly here when we're thinking about, you know, where is the blank? Is it on a side or a corner? When you do this type of analysis or in Rubik's Cube, where you don't have to do this, there isn't this sort of distribution. The equilibrium distribution and the heuristic distribution are the same because we always have like a branching factor of 18 in the sliding, in the uh, in Rubik's Cube. Um, then we're left with just basically saying, hey, um, our heuristic is going to reduce our depth. It's going to keep the branching factor the same. Um, so this, is, this works under a certain number of assumptions. These are reasonable assumptions for the type of state spaces we look at. And so now we know um, that a, a heuristic is like doing, basically it's like doing a shallower breadth first search. Um, because if, we're, if we were, we have some problem, you know, that was doing b to the d, we know the branching factor has to stay the same, so we're going to be something like b to the d minus k. Um, or this is there's there's more analysis here, but for this particular lecture, I'm not going to go any deeper. So please read some of the other work in this area if you'd like to go deeper. But uh, we can now understand how we can use the impact of or understand the impact of a heuristic on the type of heuristic search problems we have. And we're going to, uh, we're done with that ana this analysis. And in the next lecture, we will be continuing to look at the impact of inconsistent heuristics, which we've been, we've been putting off for a while. But they do, like here for, here for instance, we've assumed a consistent heuristic. And so now we're going to see what happens with those in practice. So I hope to see you in that next lecture.